All right. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Steve Miller. I'm an intelligence analyst with Anomaly. And the reason I'm on this call today is to introduce Anomaly, talk a little bit about our threat intelligence platform, and show off a little bit about how our integrations with Cisco can speed up uh, detection and response times. Altogether, it's about making life easy um, for an analyst. Um, so I think we all know that threat intelligence is a key element of a strong security program. Uh, Ten years ago, the so-called threat intel was not really a thing, but in the past couple of years, um, we've seen a shift in this direction. People like me study malware and threat actors with the purpose of increasing our ability to detect and respond to malicious activity. Um, and then one of the primary distillates of that threat research is indicators, such as domains, IPs, hashes, and the like. And one of the main problems that we all face is using these indicators for something useful. So in my opinion, it's not enough to just understand the threat actors. Um, it's not enough just to have IOCs. You want to be able to organize and operationalize that knowledge. And uh, that's challenging for a couple of reasons. And we'll get into that uh, shortly. Uh, I think we can recognize that the data uh, overload problem is measurable. We track hundreds of millions of IOCs. Uh, known bad IPs, domains, etc. And in most security environments, we've got, you know, billions of event uh, logs per day. Stand by. All right. <laughs> Technical difficulties aside. Um, so what I was saying is we've just got too many IOCs. Um, you know, between domains and IPs and hashes, uh, all the security event logs and all the interdependent security systems um, they all have to talk to each other and share information to kind of, you know, deal with um, all of the IOC data. Um, we've done a couple of studies, and I, th I think everybody kind of knows and agrees that threat intel is necessary for, uh, you know, a good, robust security program. But most people also agree that they're just overwhelmed with data. And so this was kind of the reason that uh, Anomaly, you know, uh, exists, is to help make threat intel data more accessible and more valuable to the people that have it. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how Anomaly does this. We have a couple of approaches to helping organizations um, integrate and operationalize threat intel. We have three kind of main products. Um, the first is um, something we call Stacks. It's designed to help organizations ingest threat intelligence. Um, kind of get your hands on it, search through it, export it, import it, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a free client that supports sticks and taxi protocols, and it lets you kind of connect to any threat intel feed um, that offers those, those types of data. Um, our third product is called uh, Anomaly Enterprise. It's primarily designed to use IOCs for matching on real-time and historical data. Um, across anything that you kind of want to put in there. And then once you come across some evil, rather than, you know, do your investigation by collecting stuff from a bunch of different sources, it gives you the ability to conduct uh, validation and investigation in one place. And then ThreatStream, which is kind of the main point of discussion for today, is our, our flagship product. It's a threat intelligence platform. Um, ThreatStream is kind of designed to help you collect all your threat intel, um, all your various feeds internally and externally, and then normalize and organize that data so that it can be useful inside your network. And what I think is really cool about that is, um, you know, just the, the idea that you can put all of your relevant uh, Intel data in a single source and in a single model. And that makes it really easy to manage and query. And then when you got it all organized, um, you can use uh, ThreatStream to integrate with other products such as your firewalls um, or your SIM. Um, so like I said, we'll just kind of focus on ThreatStream, and I'll break this into a couple of parts, um, dig a little bit deeper here. Um, you know, again, it's really about getting control of your intelligence. A lot of companies will have, you know, half a dozen different intel feeds from different vendors or, you know, open source and public stuff. And you want to you be able to have a one-stop shop to collect, manage, and integrate um, all that data. Um, starting with collection, you know, ThreatStream does a lot of the heavy lifting, um, you know, from any, you know, myriad of sources as, as, you know, depending on your access and interest. It could be open source, premium feeds, any sticks or uh, taxi feeds, really. 
Um, if you belong to an ISAC and you want to pull in data from that community, um, it's pretty easy to do. And then when you have all of this data, you know, kind of collected, you want to think about ways to homogenize it, right? Every feed has its own formats, its own data types, its own tags and taxonomies. And ThreatStream is there to help reconcile and normalize all of those different feed formats into a unified model. And then once you have all that stuff kind of in there, um, you know, you can enrich it and connect it um, with um, additional context, whether that's machine context or that's relational context based on, you know, human analytical decisions that have been made elsewhere. And the point is to get all your context for a given indicator in one spot so you don't have to query, you know, an IP a hundred times across a hundred different tools um, if, you, if you see something that you, you know, you really want to ask a question about. Um, all, all the data in a single spot. Um, and then, you know, dedupe so that you don't have extraneous information from multiple sources. Um, and then in terms of, you know, once you've got it all managed, um, you know, I think the, you know, again, you want to do something with your data rather than just kind of play around with it. So you can take all that organized and curated data and, you know, pump it into your internal systems. You've got SIMs, you've got firewalls, you've got, you know, different types of intrusion systems, security appliances, endpoint agents, or whatever. And the way that these can all do detection matching or policy enforcement or whatever you want, um, you can all have that done based on the Intel data that you're feeding um, and organizing from ThreatStream. And then in terms of integrations, the other thing is that um, everything in, in ThreatStream is accessible through the API. So if you want to do custom in integrations or if you want to whip up some new hotness and something that's really not publicly available, you can do that too. And then the other, I guess the, you know, last but not least, the other kind of cool thing about ThreatStream is um, you know, it has to do with sharing. And I think everybody talks about Intel sharing. Um, I think people know that it's important, but often, you know, struggle to find a common platform or a method, you know, through which to conduct sharing. And one of the key capabilities of ThreatStream is that it provides, um, I guess, a, a forum or a venue to share intelligence back to the community. Um, so we, you know, through the platform, we provide a system of, you know, quote, quote unquote, trusted circles which are basically, you know, vetted communities of peers. These could be your same industry, same geography. They could be, you know, you know, secret, private, trusted circles, um, and you can control the membership in any of these groups. Um, so this gives you total control over, you know, what you share and who can see it. Um, many of the ISACs have trusted circles as well as, um, you know, private uh, intelligence sharing groups, um, you know, that you probably already know of. Um, moving on to kind of integrations, um, my fundamental theory, again, which is debatable, is that Intel for its own sake is, is, is basically worthless. You have, to, you have to do something useful with it. Um, and so we do that by connecting um, ThreatStream with a lot of the major security systems that are kind of out there and in play. Um, we have a dedicated team of engineers focused on, you know, making sure that the platform, you know, works well with a lot of the major security products. Um, here you see kind of a sampling of the things that we integrate with. You know, you've got your SIMS endpoint agents, you got your firewalls. Um, we'd also highlight, you know, uh, you know, Cisco Umbrella as being one of the more uh, dope integrations, uh, so to speak. Um, so we're constantly developing new integrations and we offer um, APIs and customization services, again, if you, if you want something unique. And then there's a slight kind of, uh, I'd call it a derivative of an integration um, where we kind of make uh, feeds more accessible um, through our app store. Um, so basically our app store is a place where you can discover, you can trial, and you can even uh, purchase different types of raw uh, threat intelligence feeds from from our partners. So, you know, right through the App Store, we have dozens of free kind of feeds, and you know, you can kind of browse the premium ones that can easily connect to your instance of ThreatStream. Um, you know, again, just expediting your ability to get data into your platform um, when you integrate it to all your stuff. And again, this is just kind of making things easy for analysts. The ability to procure uh, premium feeds um, is pretty convenient. 
if you ask me. Um, and it also eliminates the need to set up and manage and negotiate uh, tons of different vendor contracts and, and you know, customized scripts to import uh, things into your various systems. Um, so here, you know, again, we kind of highlight um, a lot of the interesting feeds, but, you know, one of the ones we, we especially like is the uh, Cisco Threat Grid um, kind of integration here where, you know, the global telemetry provided by Threat Grid can kind of come in and do, um, you know, matching and detection against uh, indicators in your environment um, long before they actually affect you. So, you know, I, I especially like, um, you know, getting the data for uh, emerging things um, before it's kind of howling at my gate. So again, you know, everything we do um, in terms of our platform is all about making um, security analysts uh, more effective and more efficient. Um, I've been on SOC teams, I've been on IR teams, I've been on Intel teams over the last couple of years and you know what I've learned during that time is that analysts uh, need to investigate and respond to like tons of different types of things but the real takeaway is that no matter what type of thing an analyst is doing you almost always have to query for context on uh, you know the more atomic IOCs such as domains and IPs and hashes. Um, an analyst might get an alert from a security appliance and oftentimes those appliances you know sometimes don't have a ton of context except to provide a starting point um, for an investigation. You know here's the alert name, here's the IP address and that's where the real work begins because you have to validate that security event and you have to take the IOCs from you know the alert and build out the context of where it has been seen and in association with what. Uh, typically you know a lot of analysts still do this today there's a lot of Google searching and data repository searching a ton of just manual work copying and pasting the things to aggregate uh, information um, about an IOC. So you start with your who is data, you, you kind of pivot to passive DNS if you have it. Not a lot of people have um, you know a really robust data source like that. And then you have to go to malware reports and look for connections. Um, and you get started, you started with just one thing and you have this whole mess of context that's really difficult to organize and store for the long term. And oh you know don't forget you have to search through your internal network uh, data sources to determine if any of these IOCs actually have a presence in your environment. And then maybe that's a log search over, you know, like a month's worth of data, um, you know, which could take a ton of time. And, you know, historically, and I think most analysts don't want to confess to this, is that, you know, a lot of people are just using Notepad and copying and pasting all this stuff into a Notepad. Um, to kind of get it done in order to come to a conclusion ab about, you know, any given indicator context. And that's just messy and it takes a lot of time. So, you know, our approach, you know, again, is to just centralize things and do a lot of the context gathering within our platform itself. So you've got your, in, you know, your initial indicator, uh, baddomain.com, and uh, our platform automatically associates that indicator with the related IPs and email addresses and URLs and hashes and so forth. So if the IOC has an association to things like specific threat actors and campaigns and actor methodologies, we'll automatically co connect those dots uh, to the indicator. And furthermore, if you've got you know, your integrations at work with your security technologies, you can see the matches um, of your, your, your Intel IOCs across your network and all this happens you know, in seconds and minutes uh, rather than hours and days. And the kind of gist of it is that, you know, you know, again, from the perspective that most companies have multiple Intel providers and multiple feeds, and, you know, put quite simply, you don't want to search four or five different portals. You need an easy way to connect all this data so you can quit spending time, you know, wrangling IOCs and, you know, spend more of your time doing the work that matters, which is finding and responding to threats um, as they affect you. So, you know, that can manifest in tons of different ways. You know, one of the, you know, real first use cases for the platform um, were, you know, at very large organizations, you have tons of different security teams. You got SOC teams, you got a CERT team, you got an Intel team. And a lot of those teams don't have, you know, 
great workflows for managing security data um, between themselves. So, you know, a lot of times an Intel team does some research, finds some IOCs, emails the SOC, and asks them to do a search. Um, but then there's like a shift change. And, uh, you know, long story short, you have a lot of different types of sharing that needs to happen. And you need uh, a bunch of, you need the ability for a bunch of different teams to contribute to organizing data. Um, so, you know, maybe in, in this kind of case, you know, we have, you know, an Intel team, you know, creates a new threat actor or identifies a new campaign. And in our platform, they might publish a threat bulletin, which kind of, um, you know, enumerates what the campaign is about and provides some IOCs. And then the SOC team may init initiate an investigation using those IOCs to kind of look through the environment to see if it's actually affecting the organization. And again, that's a very trivial workflow. Um, but you know, this this is very much um, how a lot of uh, organizations operate today. And instead of using you know a handful of different tools and uh, you know inducing a lot of uh, duplicate work. Um, you can have that all kind of done in a single spot in a single platform. Similarly, if we have, you know, uh, a phishing investigation kind of come in, you know, we have the ability to kind of take raw data and upload it to the platform, and then ThreatStream will extract the indicators and, you know, attempt to do an evaluation of you know how evil they are based on their uh, associations with other things. So imagine an analyst you know receiving a phishing email, uploading that email. Um, the platform automatically you know extracts IOCs and scores them, and then at the same time those IOCs are being put in the platform and pushed to a sim for monitoring. And then you can kind of figure out um, you know hey you know is this affecting me? Um, where are the users, uh, who is clicking on this thing, and so forth. And you can launch your investigations from there. And I think there are just a ton, ton of different ways um, that an organization might want to use this platform. And there are a lot of ways to kind of, um, you know, flex its strengths um, into different types of workflows. Um, but overall, you know, coming back to the point, having all these things integrated makes analysts get more work done. Um, in, you know, if it's about protecting an enterprise, it's, you know, empowering the analysts to do what they need to do as quickly as possible. So that's kind of the gist of, uh, you know, anomaly. That's the driving forces, you know, behind why we're here and what we're trying to do with our, with our products. Um, it's all about making life easy for, for analysts. A little bit of background um, about us as a company. We've been around since 2013. Um, we're founded by, largely by the team that, um, you know, uh, created ArcSight, which is one of the largest kind of sims in the biz. Um, you know, this company really saw the promise of threat intel data, but we, we really wanted to help the world um, by producing things that help make that intel data more valuable. So that's why Anomaly is here. We worked with a lot of uh, large companies, banks, um, Fortune 100 companies. We work with organizations like High Trust and, and a handful of the ISACs, National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance. And then we also, you know, we try to give back to the broader cybersecurity community, you know, through free projects like Stacks and, and the Modern Honey Network, which is one of the most uh, widely deployed open source honeypot systems. Um, so again, that's just a little bit about us as a company. We'll pivot into a demo of uh, ThreatStream shortly. Um, but with that, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about ThreatGrid. Hey, thank you, Steve. I sure appreciate that. And I'll go through these very quickly because we want to get to the, the live demo. So when we just uh, as you pass the control over to me, that'd be awesome. So in the chat window, you see, great. In the chat window, for those that are attending, you see that there's ability to send a chat to the organizer and the presenters. Uh, please go ahead and send your questions there. We look forward to talking about those that the organizers and the panelists send us those questions. So when we get into the live demo of Threat Grid, you're going to see a few things. One is that there's no instrumentation inside the 
sandbox the dynamic malware analysis that would give away its presence. So malware is able to see that it's inside a sandbox. The You'll see that it's not just a sandbox in a bubble. You'll have integrated threat intelligence. And we are built from the very beginning to be very easy to read, API-driven, for automated analysis, provide that rich context, and then have integration through the API with our partners, such as Anomaly. So we have this outside-in approach with no presence inside there. We'll see that the samples both have static and dynamic analysis, and you're able to pivot into IP addresses and domains and other artifacts as well. And with the, with this data, then you can identify these attacks in their real time as working with Anomaly and their platform. So originally with SOC teams that were using ThreatGrid, uh, we've seen advancement into the threat intelligence teams like the Anomaly has shared, and then also the instant response teams and those that are integrating the platforms because we have to work together. Cisco, we believe that effective cybersecurity has to be simple, open, and automated, and that's what we execute on, and that's what this is about, is making it simple, open, and also the automation with our partners. The real power of the record we'll see is based on these behavioral indicators and what the malware is actually doing, and that's how we're able to see new threats, such as WannaCry when it came out. It was a new variant, but it had some common things, such as leading the shadow copy, changing the wallpaper with registry key, encrypting on disk, writing to the USB drive, some of those behaviors that gave it a threat score of 100 even before there were any other signatures or things like that. So we see millions of samples every day both in the cloud and we also offer an appliance for those customers that need to have that confidentiality. And to give that intelligence to our partners through the feeds that were discussed, those from the community, as well as those submitted by your organization as well. So I'm going to hand it over to my partner here, Jeremy, who's gonna talk about a little bit about Umbrella and then we'll get right into the demonstration. Great, thanks Jessica. Um, I'm Jeremy, I'm uh, the product manager for uh, Umbrella Investigate. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Investigate and how it works as part of a SOC team process. So, um, so as, as a SOC, you, you likely have some some issues with internet-wide visibility. So you see the, the, the uh, information about what's going on in your own environment, but you're not actually getting visibility into global trends uh, and how attackers are actually using that infrastructure um, in a, you know, from, a, from a high level. Um, you also probably have a ton of different alerts uh, and you have, you have trouble prioritizing the invest the, your investigations because you just see so many alerts at once. Um, and then, you, you, you know, you have a hard time operationalizing that threat intelligence um, because of the fact that it's often unreliable in the data. And then, of course, as, you, as we all know, um, you likely have limited resources. There probably aren't that many senior incident responders, uh, and, um, you, you know, it's a little hard to operationalize that, that environment. Uh, but so, so this is what your visibility day probably looks like. So you, look, you, can, you can see your own network and a bunch of IPs that are being queried by your own endpoint. Um, but in reality, the picture kind of looks more like this, where not only are those IPs, but those IPs correspond to domains. Uh, those domains, those IPs host other domains on them. And then those domains and IPs are communicated with by, um, by malware files, uh, that, and, and they might have those networks might have good reputation, they might have bad reputation. How are you able to know without something that gives you a global view of the internet? Now, with Investigate, you actually get that global view. So you get the intelligence around uh, domains, IPs, and malware, and how they all interconnect with each other across the internet. Uh, we do that by providing a, a live graph of DNS requests and other contextual data that's all correlated against umbrella statistical models. Um, so you can use that data to discover and predict malicious domains and IPs in your attacker infrastructure before they're actually able to target you. And then, um, because this is available as either a, a web-based console or a real-time RESTful API, you can enrich the security data that you already have in your system with our global intelligence through our API, uh, and you can plug an API into systems like Anomaly uh, to be able to operate off of that pane of glass instead of uh, a console if you so choose. 
So how does this actually all work? Um, well, it all really starts with data. So we see an enormous amount of data, not just from um, enterprise customers, uh, but, but also from all of the users who are using the open DNS free DNS resolution service. Um, even though those are not enterprise customers, we're actually gathering that data and using it to, to provide analytics and value to our enterprise customers and then the customers who buy investigate. Um, we not only have a lot of data, we estimate that we see about 2% of the world's DNS traffic, but we have a really wide penetration, so we see a lot of uh, data around countries that you and your organization might not normally be seeing, and this helps you provide, you know, the best global view of threat data. And then once we have that data, um, we all, we correlate it all against statistical models, uh, such as there are simple ones uh, like basic reputation scoring, um, and then there are things that are more sophisticated, like doing DNS time series analysis to determine domains that are related to each other because they're being looked up at the same time. All those models are being run through in real time. Uh, it's not just uh, historical data, it's also live data, and, and we're continually recomputing this model to provide better threat analytics for our customers. So using all of this data, the associations data, um, as well as the reputation and scoring data, we're actually able to show you where attacks are staged and we're actually able to discover attacker infrastructure before it's able to target your organization. So Investigate combines a lot of different sort of threat intelligence and enrichment sets, such as passive DNS, who is information, um, malware file analysis, anomaly detection, and we know that it's possible to get all of this information either in open source solutions uh, or piecemeal through different products, but the real power of investigating is that this information is all correlated together and it's all provided in a single correlated source. So, so what is investigate used for? Um, so you can use our intelligence uh, to, you can use our scores to prioritize investigation and response by focusing on uh, the most suspicious or bad scoring domains first. Um, you can also use uh, our, our association data to speed up investigations by, re by reducing your, your time to remediation by understanding very quickly what's going on with the domain. And then you can pivot around your attacker's infrastructure to help stay ahead of those attacks uh, even you know, during or before they're targeting you. And then of course with our API, you can enrich other systems like your internal systems, uh, Anomaly or your SIM, uh, with that live context around what's happening globally on the internet. So to conclude the value of Investigate, if you know a single IOC based on the local intelligence that you're seeing on your network, um, we're able to go and use our global context to pivot out and discover all of its relationships. So with that, uh, I'm going to go uh, and, uh, and hand it off back to Steve, who's going to um, show us uh, a little bit more of Anomaly and how you can use it in a real-world incident. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, all right, so let's just talk a little bit about ThreatStream. Um, so right now I'm kind of showing off um, the ThreatStream kind of uh, basic platform. We're going to interact with the GUI a little bit. We'll take a little bit of a tour, and then I'll kind of show you or at least articulate a little bit about how the workflow, um, you know, kind of marches forward as you're investigating uh, different things. So right now we're looking at the ThreatStream dashboard. This is the home page. Um, imagining once again that you're a customer with multiple different kind of Intel vendors, you're getting tons of different indicators. You've got all of this coming in one place and you wanna, you wanna know what your intelligence pipeline looks like. So right here we can kind of see which types of indicators we're getting um, over the last week. Um, we can see the counts, we can see them go up and down with time. If we have intelligence vendors that are um, adding things like actors or campaigns or incidents to our threat model, we can see updates happening here with the different threat actors. Um, when all of the different feeds are coming in, um, each of the indicators will have different uh, confidence and severity levels based on um, ingestion or things that are done by the uh, vendors themselves. Um, all of these can help you, you know, decide which things, you know, go to which block lists or get investigated first, um, ultimately helping you prioritize um, how you investigate any matches 
um, should they happen in your environment. And so we can also see some other kind of biographical or um, address namespace. Um, and then also if we have an integration thing like Splunk, which we have right here, we can see uh, matches on any of our um, indicators in our own environment and, and when those are happening as well. So that's kind of the overview of the dashboard. We also have a couple of different other ways to look at um, you know, the statistics, um, a lot of fancy little graphs about um, where your feeds are coming from and which ones are producing value um, for you. All, again, helping you get control of your data feeds um, from your threat intelligence providers. And we've got a couple other things. Um, when we go and we think about you know, searching the actual IOCs in the model, um, we have a lot of different ways to kind of query that. We can, you know, query in the, in the search box in the top right of the screen. When we come and look at all the different observables, um, we can filter them down by the different indicator types that we have. Um, you know, these will depend, again, on how the indicators are coming in based on how you map the indicators um, into your model. Um, we can search for active and inactive indicators. Um, indicators when they come in are only going to be active for a certain amount of time. As you know, things like domains and, and IPs and hashes have a certain half-life. They're not going to always be uh, super valuable indicators for, for things like detection or, um, or anything like that. And we have, um, you know, uh, it, you can see indicators that are either publicly shared or, you know, put in by, say, Anomaly. Um, or shared by other members um, in your community, as well as your trusted streams um, and so forth. So again, we can search all of our indicators in one spot, and that's really powerful um, across all of our different vendor feeds that are coming in here. Um, I think I, I'm searching roughly, you know, you know, a billion or so curated indicators um, in just my instance of uh, ThreatStream at this time. Uh, moving on to kind of uh, highlighting what I was speaking about in the integrations. Um, because I'm an organization administrator for my account on ThreatStream, um, I can view uh, the integrations that I have in place. Um, basically, it's as simple as coming in here and, um, you know, there are a bunch of different integrations. Once I add my integration package, I basically just add my uh, API, you know, keys or, or uh, account credentials. Um, into these uh, little, you know, GUI boxes, and then immediately the data will be flowing between ThreatStream and then the uh, whatever the integration technology that I have in place. So, for example, you can see right here that I have um, Umbrella and Investigate uh, integrations um, with data flowing back and forth between these uh, things. Um, similarly, as I mentioned uh, before, um, we have the App Store here, so, you know, again, dozens and dozens of different, um, you know, different threat feeds that you can just kind of click to activate and bring right into your ThreatStream instance. Um, and you can also discover the ones that are going to be really easy to kind of plug in um, to, your, to your ThreatStream model if, if this is something you have. Um, but it also gives you an idea of just the variety of uh, Intel providers that are kind of out there. And uh, obviously, you can see um, we have our uh, Cisco uh, threat grid data um, just plugged in. Um, it doesn't show it here, but just plugged in. Um, it's as easy as activating it uh, right through this panel. Um, in terms of uh, kind of looking at uh, how the streams are coming in, you have total control over, you know, the, the data that you're getting from these different um, feeds. So here, you know, we can see I have the threat grid uh, data feed coming in. It's providing mainly uh, file hashes um, in, this, uh, in this query. Um, and if you wanted to create new stream source, um, you can do that with total custom mappings. You can set your own um, classification levels, confidence levels. Um, you can, you know, change the uh, periodicity at which you pull this data. And you can change the indicator types that um, any of the data um, kind of maps to. You could have low confidence feeds, you could have high confidence feeds, and then you could integrate those differently um, into your other technologies based on, you know, things like the feed source and the, and the confidence and so forth. Again, you know, giving you control of wrangling um, all the different feeds uh, you, you've got. 
you know, if you haven't heard me say that enough, um, I'll probably say it again. Um, so coming back to kind of uh, the observables that we're getting, you know, so again here kind of just showing off, um, we've got tons of um, indicators flowing in from threat grid. So right now we can see, you know, if we search by the feed that we're looking at, we can see, you know, what are, what are the indicator types that are flowing in, when they flow in, you know, the original source, um, and then automatically when this data is coming in, we're getting um, context tags about why the data is in there. So, you know, for any of these given domains, you can kind of look and based on the tags, you know, you get a pretty good sense that, you know, each of these suspicious domains has some sort of suspicious malware file um, associated with it. And this is true for basically all of the data that comes in. Um, you can have it tagged, um, you know, based on the feed, but you can also add custom tags uh, to it as well. So uh, let's talk a little bit, uh, doing demos is hard because there's a huge amount of artificiality um, to the environment. So I'll ask everyone to kind of use your imaginations um, with this one. Um, but this is what it looks like when we pull into, um, you know, inspecting an actual observable. So when we're looking at this IP address in our platform, you know, we have a severity level that is a mix of confidence and threat score. There are a couple of things that go into this. One of is the preset um, ratings of the source feeds, but also there's some whiz-bang technology stuff going um, to um, do associations and, and do uh, automatic ranking of the confidence and, and severity of these indicators based on associations. Um, we can see that we automatically have a lot of, um, you know, context based on, you know, the GIYP data, um, you know, we're running it against uh, blacklist and virus total to look for mentions and things like that. Um, you have the ability to look at the uh, address space and, you know, quick and easy links to pull up um, additional uh, views of this indicator um, through some of the most common tools. And you can also export it or, you know, if it came in as a true positive, you uh, have the ability to adjust um, its, its kind of status here. Um, so say, you, you know, you're looking at this IP in your platform, you can see the source where it came from. I have a, the Symantec um, reputation feed, so that's where I'm getting this indicator. And because I have an integration, I can also see where and when it's matching in my environment. So I see it a handful of times, you know, over the past month, um, you know, imagining that this is something super bad. Um, I would want to go ahead and, and kick off an investigation, and we have the ability to do that right here in the platform. So we'll pivot to a different uh, kind of IP address rather than this one. Um, so here's an IP. This one looks pretty bad. Um, I have the ability to kind of add this to an investigation right here. So we have investigations kind of built in. Um, an investigation is a way for, you know, I was describing the problem where analysts are cop constantly having to copy and paste data and attach indicators and take down notes and notepad. Um, and then, you know, share that with different teams across an enterprise. You know, the investigations are really a way to share that experience across multiple analysts and multiple teams who all have access to the platform. So if this were the, you know, the IP address that I really wanted, um, I would go ahead and, and create an investigation based off, off this. So this is what an investigation looks like when it's created. Um, you and I have an investigation name and maybe you would have some sort of, you know, uh, format or, or nomenclature or naming convention. Um, but you have, you know, basic workflow stuff around when the investigation was created, who it's assigned to, who started it, the tags. If you wanted to share this with a trusted circle, you could do that here, um, as well as some task management. So if this were a real incident, I may have one task for um, you know, one analyst to go locate the, you know, originating system and for another analyst to find um, malware associations um, with the IP address in question. Um, if we were using a specific threat model, um, we could, you know, define which model we were using and then attach indicators um, to those parts of the model, you know, again, to help flesh out um, you know, our workflow and what we're walking through to make sure that we don't miss anything 
um, you know, while we're moving through this this sort of incident. If there were threat bulletins that were related, or or actors that were related that were in our model, we could also attach them to the investigation too. Um, the idea is making this a one-stop shop um, for all the activity that's related um, to the to this uh, investigation or incident, including. Um, workflow and analysts um, and uh, indicators themselves. So you can see here that I attach the IP address in question um, to the investigation as I'm kind of walking forward. And anytime I get, you know, an investigation based on an IP address, um, immediately I wouldn't want to pivot for more context. So we'll go back to the IP address here and we can see, um, you know, I've got a little bit of an exploratory graph here. Um, you know, this is just rendered in the browser. This all uses the ThreatStream API to explore the data. Um, but I can search ThreatStream for related indicators. I can search here, um, you know, the open DNS relationships um, with that data to help kind of flush out um, if there are any things associated um, with this IP address based on my integrations and my data feeds that I have in place. And right away, based on, you know, the, the open DNS data, um, I was able to pull out a domain from this. So like, that's super easy. Um, and there are just a bunch of ways to kind of explore that data um, in this kind of graph tool. And if you don't want to play with the, with the you know, the whiz bang graphs, a lot of this is automatically enriched um, below the indicator. Um, so we can see that, you know, this was, uh, you know, submitted twice um, by semantic, you know, reputation feeds. Um, we have our, uh, passive DNS data, which is automatically populated based on your passive DNS uh, sources, you know, again, that you have kind of connected together. Um, so I can see my uh, open DNS domains that have previously resolved to this IP address. And then based on uh, relationships, um, we can see that uh, is, a, is another method of enrichment here. Um, we can also, if we wanted to do an IP uh, who is lookup, um, we could do that, you know, again, all in this one, one spot, making it super easy uh, for the analyst to get this done without, you know, going to a bunch of different windows and whatnot. So pivoting from, um, you know, from, from the IP address, say we found this domain, and we want to look at this domain and figure out more about it. So, you know, we go and we examine the domain, um, you know, indicator itself. Um, we can see all the different tags. We can see, you know, again, a lot of the associations that we have um, with the domain itself. We can see that, you know, uh, based on virus total data, there were some associations with the domain. Um, there are some UR malicious URLs. We have the registry information. Um, and we can also see that, you know, this domain was actually already in our platform and it was submitted by uh, ThreatGrid. So again, We've got a couple of different ways to look at all of this integration with our with our uh, DNS and our malware data is all in this one spot to make investigation like snappy. Um, so none of this obscure pivoting and, and magic mojo to find out connections and relationships between data. It's all kind of here in one place and uh, it makes my life easy if all I want to do is find connections um, to things that are relevant uh, to the specific incident. So then I could just pop open ThreatGrid, and uh, because I know that this is from ThreatGrid, I have a pretty good idea that if I pop into ThreatGrid, I'm going to be able to see um, samples that you know came from that domain. And right away, just by searching ThreatGrid, I can already see that there's a PDF, looks like there's an EXE, um, all within the last month um, relating to this domain. So again, this is me taking an IP, moving to a domain, moving to malware, um, making that investigation um, extremely fast um, from an analytical point of view. And I guess that's a good spot to kind of pivot in um, to talk a little bit more about ThreatGrid. Hey, thank you for that. That was a great demo to show how this all comes together and appreciate you passing over the ball to me, Steve. Showing all these, thank you so much. So this is where you you came into here with the search and for ThreatGrid, we provide these threat intelligence feeds hourly and daily from samples that we've seen from real analysis. So I'm just going to briefly show how you can understand greater context about the samples from that intelligence. So this is where Steve came to where he, the search was done. 
I can see the behavioral indicator, so clicking on that gives me the report. So we have a partnership with Reversing Labs, and they saw that one of the artifacts dropped by this was indeed malicious and gives us that intelligence there. But a really malicious behavior that we're seeing also is that a file that has been downloaded is also executed, and this is what the behavior is that is seen there. I can see other samples because it's integrated through intelligence, other samples that are are also doing the same behavior. Now this file it opens up an alternate data stream as well, which is a methodology of hiding things as, as well. Also we see that its original name is actually this. This is what is called that the user sees, so it looks like it's something innocuous. It's a browser plugin for Chrome is what they think, but it's really this here as well. And then of course it's launched and codes injected into memory and other nastiness that is going on. So some of the things that you can do to dig in deeper if you wish to was to go into the processes where you can actually we have what's called a process graph so you can see visually what's occurring there on the endpoint as the changes to the registry and the file system as well. Some other things that are seen is that um, artifacts are dropped on here. And we saw that one that was dropped here it is and it goes through static analysis. You can also download that or resubmit that and I actually ran that through analysis here and here's the actual file itself again flagged by a number of different partners that we have. So another thing that you can do is to understand the network just as Steve had shown you and here we see where it had gone out to and we have a lot of information about that HTTP traffic. So I can pivot on this to get a URL report and here's the URL, the host, the IP addresses, other URLs. Learning more about this, again, greater that, in that greater context, I can go to the domain report for that host and this who is information is coming from Umbrella, Jeremy's side there. So I can see where about the domain, also related IP addresses, and clicking on that will give me additional information here as well, where it is being hosted out, the URLs, related samples. So our partnership that we have with our sister technology there in Umbrella have the ability to pivot out to that as well to find out more about this domain. Um, Jeremy, do you want to just come off mute and talk about this real quick, just to save time? Um, I don't know if I'm going to yeah. give you the absolutely control. Thanks, ahead. So, yeah, you can you can kind of see just from, just from looking at this domain some of the information that Investigate tells you. Um, so obviously, the, the first thing you see in our security summary is that it's part of our block list that we're associated with a particular threat. Um, we also have a top line risk score that goes from negative 100 to positive 100, and in this case, it's negative 75, which is pretty bad. And then you can also kind of look at the DNS query volume graph, and you can see um, you can see just generally the volume of, of queries that we've seen. It doesn't look like a very prevalent attack, but you can see it was registered relatively recently by an email address that we don't have registering anything else. You can see that around the time it was registered, a couple, one or two days later was when we started seeing queries for it. And then, of course, if you scroll down, you can see the associated samples that are behind uh, behind this. Um, so you can also you can see that you know when we started categorizing them, you can look at the, the actual uh, record information and see uh, what behaviors that that engages in. Um, and then uh, I, I, we don't have that much time left, so I, I'll, I'll kind of breeze over it. We have a lot of scores um, that, that show kind of different reputation scores on the on the domain. And then if you scroll down to the IP addresses, uh, um, the IP addresses uh, page, and you click on the IP address, um, you can actually see other malicious do other domains that this IP is hosting. So this is helpful if you're looking. If you scroll down, you can actually see. There are a few other domains hosted on on the same uh, on the same IP. Scroll, scroll down low, yeah. So you can see basically there are a few other domains hosted on that same IP. Um, and and if you wanted to do a, a deeper threat investigation, you know you could actually go and pivot into those domains. You could pivot into their into, into who's registered those domains. What else their their what other infrastructure they've, they've been associated with. Um, and this is kind of just the way that we see people using Investigate to invest to pivot around their attackers' infrastructure and discover what else is related. 
Um, there's more I could go into, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave some some time left. So uh, so th thanks, Jessica. Uh, I'll hand it back to you guys. Absolutely. Thanks for that, and it shows what great partnership that we have together. It's always a pleasure. So I'm gonna give the ball back to Steve to wrap up and close his investigation. All right. Just to kind of conclude things. You know, the reason that we, you know, in this scenario, we went from IP to domain to malware, you know, from an analyst point of view, you know, when you have an incident, you want to figure out, you know, the context of the incident so that you can identify uh, what your, you know, response or immediate remediation actions are going to be. Um, so in this case, you know, we, you know, maybe we could infer that this was likely from a phishing uh, email, um, seeing as how there was a PDF involved. We could go back to our investigation and kind of add all that, you know, which tasks were completed, um, add all the associated information that we've gotten between, um, you know, threat stream, between, uh, you know, threat grid, and uh, between umbrella. All of that context we can kind of put in one place and, and close here. And then, you know, the big takeaway is that we figured out all of this stuff um, associated with the incident. And now the kind of question is, um, what do we do with it? And I guess, um, you know, the recommendation would be, you know, take what you learn really quickly and what you've done in the investigation really quickly, and then you want to apply that to your technology. So it makes sense to have all of these things kind of working together. And if you have different uh, endpoint or network products that you can pump this intelligence into, you can do things like um, block uh, domains and IPs, and you can quarantine systems um, and so forth. Um, so I think to add a little bit of context to that, uh, Jessica, do you have anything else to kind of uh, close words on? Yeah, I sure appreciate that. So we take an architectural approach here at, at Cisco, and this intelligence, you know, with this detection that has occurred and getting all this intelligence that is then shared through the advanced malware protection architecture through this threat intelligence cloud with what we have an integrated threat defense. So if you've ever watched Star Trek, The Next Generation, and you saw that they came across the Borg, and the first time they saw a Borg drone and they shot it with a Federation phaser, it was a zero-day attack against that drone and it was killed. The next time they fired the phaser, then the shield came up because they adapt and they shared that intelligence with all the other endpoints, drones within the collective, as well as any other attack vector. And that's what we've done here at Cisco as well. We're not the Borg, although we have reached our 200th acquisition. And I love being here at Cisco and having me part of this team. But that concept is you can learn from your, your enemies and my background in the military. But you can take that, be hurt once in one place, and then share it everywhere. And if you don't have, if you don't learn from the intelligence of others, just as Stephen showed, through the demonstration with Anomaly and also as Jeremy talked about, then a zero day to you. So we need to learn from the intelligence and again, that information from that malicious sample is shared on your edge, on your endpoint, your email, your web, and so on. So we have just a moment to, for a couple of questions that have, have come in and the question like, how do you handle samples that require human interaction? So when you submit a sample in Threat Grid, you have the ability to do what's called a playbook where you can have automated interactions such as closing the pop-up that's there, just clicking OK, clicking on a link inside an embedded document. So that was a, a great question. Uh, there was a question to you, Steve, about how people can get licensing information. I know that in the webinar we have the link to your marketplace page. Yep, li licensing information. Um, you know, check out the link on the webinar. Really easy to reach out to our folks and we can we can talk about getting access to the various uh, integrations or products that we've kind of talked about today. Thank you. And Jeremy, there's a question to you about the API. So it looks like the API is very robust with Umbrella, as was shown here. And there's a, a question about is there ability to, with the API, if you see something bad, to go and share that information with Umbrella to do blocking? Is that something that's possible? Yeah, so if, if you if you have the Umbrella product, this is sort of a, a separate product from the Umbrella Investigate product, but if you have both, uh, or if you just have the Umbrella product and you find something that's malicious, uh, we have what's called our Enforcement API, which lets you send uh, the, the, the IOC to Umbrella to be blocked, uh, and this is useful for, you know, things like
like anomaly where you're where you're acting on IOC data inside of a console. It's also you know useful if you want to go and ingest threat feeds or anything else that you consume from an external source and want to plug into Umbrella's enforcement network. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, like that's all the time we have, so we'll turn it back over to our lovely host, our organizer, and thank you so much everyone for joining. This has been recorded.